Hi, and welcome to The Missing Middle. I'm Kara Stern. And I'm Mike Moffat. And today we welcome Alex Usher, who is president of the consulting firm Higher Education Strategy Associates. And he's here to talk to us about public-private partnerships and international students. So welcome. Hi there. Yeah, thanks for being here, Alex. The federal government's announcements of a two-year cap in international student permits made for some big headlines last week, and I personally didn't understand the relationship between universities and colleges and PPPs until Mike explained it to me, and he kept explaining it using references to a post that you had made online, so we thought we'd have you here to talk about it. Can you kind of explain that relationship to our audience between the colleges, universities, and the uh, the PPPs? I guess, can we start with what they are? Yeah. So a public private partnership is when a college licenses its curriculum to another uh, organization, uh, a private one in this case. Uh, and, and what happens is the private organization agrees, we'll teach any students you send us, and the public organization says, we'll grant a credential to anyone who you say finishes our curriculum. Uh, these started in Ontario around 2012, and this was around the time that uh, a lot of the GTA institutions, so places like Seneca and Centennial, were starting to get very big numbers uh, of international students. And rural colleges said it wasn't fair that they couldn't get their share of this money, right? Because you know they've they've got a uh, it, it does make for some difficulties because they all they all have to pay the same rate. They all opsues the union for all their workers. So if, if some institutions have got more money than others, that makes it harder for others to operate when they all have a common cost base. So, um, you know, these, these institutions from outside the GTA, particularly in Northern Ontario, started saying, hey, we need access to these students too. Uh, but they weren't sure that they could attract uh, international students to Timmins or Aurelia, Barry, wherever, those kinds of places, which I'm not sure was actually true, right? Because the, the, the university that's got the biggest uh, set of international students in Canada is Cape Breton University, which is now about 75% international students. So it is possible to bring students to places like Sydney. And, and I think uh, on Northern Ontario has got a few cities like that. But in any event, they, they came to the conclusion they couldn't do that. And so what they wanted to do was to set up campuses in the GTA. And the government of Ontario said, no, you can't do that. You can't just set up like you know, you have catchment areas, guys. You should focus on your part of northern Ontario. Uh, you can't just go set up in Seneca's backyard. And so the PPPs were a way around this. They said, well, this isn't our campus. This is a private campus. We're just licensing our curriculum so that students can go to this place. Okay. Um, and, and these arrangements were uh, never officially approved by the Wynn government, uh, and eventually the Wynn government said, no, we have to shut these down. Actually, the quality controls on these are not very good. So David Trick, who was a former ADM at the Minister of Colleges and Universities, he wrote a report, a very sensible report, said, yeah, we're not even vaguely set up to do quality control on, on organizations like this. Shut it down before it becomes a reputational risk. Ford government comes in and they look at this and they say, wait a minute. So you're saying if we let these students teach you know, through these arrangements, these PPP arrangements, and they can make more money this way, that means we don't have to fund them, right? Go nuts. <laughs> and so they started doing a lot of these. And in fact, they encouraged it to the point where last year they said every institution, every institution in the province can have one, at least one have a PPP with 7,500 students. Now you think about like, you know, so you've got Northern College, which is 750 students in Timmins and 7,500 students in, I believe, Scarborough. Um, and you, you know what I mean? Like that, you get some really weird arrangements this way. And of course the big, you know, the reason that they could keep stuffing in international students is because uh, any kind of college, public college credential, which is what these were, um, landed people at least theoretically on a, on a pathway to permanent residency. Um, because you, once you get a degree of a certain or a credential of a certain length, then you can get a uh, what's called a, a postgraduate work visa. And if you on the postgraduate work visa, if you get enough work experience, Canadian work experience of a certain quality, there's a whole formula around this, then you can apply for permanent residency. And so what people were being sold and mainly students from the Punjab, uh, it should be said, has come to, an, uh, come to a college 
they'll take as many of you as as there are and here's uh and here's your ticket to permanent residency and so that's what's been going on for the last five or six years it's just the ford government's been dumping gasoline on the fire uh, of 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 the housing crisis by saying hey let's have more short-term residents uh in uh, largely in the sort of 905 belt around the GTA. That's where most of these PPPs are. Some of them are downtown now. So they didn't um, care I, at all about the brand, uh, like the quality of the brand being eroded by this? Nope. Interesting. I wow. wonder why. I wish I could give a longer answer to that, but no, they didn't <laughs> care. It, just, it never occurred to them. So I, I just have a, like a lot logistics question. So if we use one of these Northern college and could literally be Northern college or w whatever else that, that has a partner in Scarborough, who's actually recruiting the students, who's doing the sort of uh, administrative function and you know, what, what is actually on the diploma when they graduate? Like, does it say Northern college or does it say yep. the Scarborough? It says, it, so it says the actual college. That's the point because they've, they've licensed the curriculum. So they have an MOU with a private entity uh, and there are a few of them. MOU being? A memorandum of understanding. And so they will have the contract basically, right? And it says, we're going we're gonna to admit the students for you. We'll go, we'll go recruit them. And by recruit, what they mean is they're going to take in money from uh, either agents in, in other countries or they'll go through an aggregator like a ply board and they'll, they'll, they'll get all these things and they'll just so here you go. Here's your admission to this institution. And often the students who they're uh, who they're admitting don't know, and until uh, the 22nd of January, didn't care whether that was a PPP or not. Because at the end of the day, the certificate that they were going to get, and this you know goes back to the the, the contract, the MOU. It says you're going to teach our. Here's our curriculum. You're going to teach it, and the private says yes, we're going to do it. And then once they're done, the agreement is is once you once the 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 college, the public college, is satisfied that they've taught that curriculum, then we'll issue a uh, a diploma or a certificate of some kind. So to clarify, the public institution recruits the students, the public institution designs the curricula, and it's the name of the public institution on the diploma that just basically the private and, school is, is doing the teaching. That's right. Yeah. And the public school admits the student, which is the more important the one for, for uh, visa purposes. How much more do international students pay for a course? Is it that they just aren't, pay they're doing the full price without the subsidies, or are they actually paying even more of a markup? I think most community colleges are charging 15, 16, 18,000. Like it's in there. It's, 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 uh, it's in the, it's in the high teens, uh, in tuition. And the institution pays a flat fee to, uh, the private college for paying them. And we have no idea what that number is because obviously those are, those contracts are secret. It will be interesting to see once those are no longer going concerns, if someone could FOI them. Uh, it would be really interesting to see if that would be possible. Um, but my guess would be they're being charged about ten thousand dollars a student, and so they're probably you know the net on that is probably about five thousand dollars a student, four or five thousand dollars. That's kind of the range. And so for not teaching anybody, if I'm if I'm north, if I'm a college like Northern and I've got seventy five hundred students at any given time. Now remember that's not necessarily per year because some of these students are on eight month programs, and so they may have only seventy five hundred at any given time, but that could still equal as many as eleven thousand in a year. Um, you know, 4,000 bucks a pop, that's 44 million. That's equal to their entire budget five years ago. How much of an issue is this outside of Ontario and the rest of the country? It's rare elsewhere, but it does exist. So Portage College has got a, a PPP arrangement in Calgary. Assiniboine College has an arrangement in Winnipeg. Uh, but, uh, you know, I would say, and, and there are what are called PPP arrangements, which are actually pathways. So there are companies that will, in effect, recruit students for you, bring them here, do first year for you, but then they go to a university. So there's a company, an Australian company called Navitas, which does that for, I think, a half dozen institutions in Canada. But that's a different phenomenon, right? They're not, they're not issuing, they're not doing the full credential. The students aren't graduating from that institution. So it's, it's a little bit different. So PPPs in the sense that Ontario does them uh, are not unknown elsewhere, but they're rare. Do either of you know why the Ford government reversed course and relaxed the regulations? Is it just that they wanted to not have to fund these places or is, is there more to it than that? Um, I always say that, you know, public funding for public universities is a public good, but um, foreign nationals paying for uh, public services is a public great. 
um, as far as as far as governments are concerned, and and certainly, I mean, that was the that you know the government Ford government came to power um, with a mantra the government should do less. So this seemed like a pretty good idea to them. Um, and and the and the Ford government is. Uh, not alone in Ontario history. I mean, Ontario has been 10th out of 10 provinces for public funding of post-secondary education for the last, for 38 of the last 40 years. I think they climbed out of the basement briefly under McGinty. Uh, but it's a very pan-partisan thing, right? Right now, per student, for every dollar that a college outside Ontario receives, a college inside Ontario receives 44 cents. Like that's the extent. They're, like funding is so low in Ontario that all nine other provinces are above average. Um, it's one of those great, um, everybody loves, everybody else loves Ontario for that kind of stuff. Makes them look so much better. Um, so mostly it's a funding issue, but it is a, it is a, an ideological one too. Like I think the, the, the government has been pretty clear in suggesting that it prefers private management, uh, in education to public and private can mean unions, right? So in, in the skills sector, they're giving a lot of money to unions to train, uh, apprentices that they're not giving to public institutions. So I think it's it is an ideological bent against public institutions. It's part of it. When do we start seeing the number of international students creep up? In colleges, it was around 2015, 2016. Um, and that was after they had uh, made some changes to make it easier, processing changes, make it easier to take students from India. Uh, that's about when some of the... Mike, and Mike, I know you've probably looked at this more than I have, um, how many... Students are, you know, what what were the big policy changes back then? I've almost forgotten, but there were a few around in the late Harper years that did sort of supercharge it that the Liberal government just never revised. And now how much of their budgets re rely on international students? I did a calculation this year that um, students from India alone put $2 billion into Ontario colleges and Queen's Park puts $1.9 so the inter international student tu tuition overall, I think, is about 60% of the 50 to 50, 60% of the total um, in Ontario colleges. So not, not all that's from PPPs, right? So, you know, places like Seneca, they've got 11, Seneca, Centennial, they've got 10, 11, 12,000 international students at their home campus. Conestoga does not use PPPs, and yet it has... Mike, what was it, 34,000 uh, visa applications this year? Like, it, it, the numbers are crazy at some places, and it's not all PPPs. Yeah. So I actually wanted to ask you about that because, you know, yes, you know, obviously there, there's funding pressures and so on. But, you know, if we look at the numbers across colleges, like you have your, your Conestogas, your Centennials that have really high numbers, and then you have others like like Algonquin here in Ottawa that, that actually have fairly modest numbers. So what, what's driving those differences between institutions? Like, like why have some become more heavily reliant on this than others? I mean, I think people in part got carried away with. It. I mean, Algonquin's probably caring about the load that you would expect in Ottawa, right? Like, I think if if you believe the line that you can't get students to go anywhere other than Toronto, which again, I'm not sure is true, but um, well, I was going to uh, say, uh, you know, Fanshawe's done pretty well in London, Ontario, and having lived in both London and Ottawa. But even uh, they've yeah. opened a PPP. They, you they know, have. Fanshawe's got like, what, I don't know, 5,000 students in, in Toronto. So, yes, I mean, I, you know, I, I, Ottawa and London are probably in a different kind of category. First of all, they have different needs. Like some institutions can balance their budget. Humber does fine with domestic students. It doesn't actually need that many international students to make its budget work. And so its numbers have stayed fairly consistent over the last few years. What's um, different I, about them? Uh, they're well run. <laughs> I should say that they gave me an honorary degree once, which I, that may change. That may change your view about whether or not they're a well-run institution. But um, just just so I'm clear about my allegiances here, uh, so I, you know, they've done it. I think uh, Centennial was one of the ones that decided early it needed to go big on international students. It was one of the first, but then it stopped. Right, so it's it's not like the Conestogas where it was just an ever increasing number. Conestoga seemed to have lost its mind in the last 24 months. And it's, it's, it's gone far beyond anything that you could, you could claim is uh, financially needed. And I think they've, um, they've had real problems in quality control, right? And there's, there's a fantastic subreddit on Conestoga, which if you read it, it's just, it's wild. Uh, just the local businesses complaining about the quality of students coming out of, out of Conestoga. It's, it's something else.
What kind of reaction are the colleges and universities having to the news of the federal cap? Depends where you are in the country. Uh, so very different. So the, here's the thing is the caps hit provinces very differently. So in Quebec, nothing, cha literally nothing changes. Um, everywhere else, um, it's a little bit trickier. Manitoba, New Brunswick, their new caps are close to the numbers they have right now. So they have to stop growing, but they probably don't need to cut back very much. Uh, PEI, Nova Scotia, British Columbia, you know, they, they will have to cut back and you have to figure out how to cut back. Um, in BC, they may say, uh, we're going to cut the, prov the privates out, right? This is an NDP government. They're not super keen on privates. They could just say, actually, you know what? We're going to reserve all our spots for public institutions. And there we go. We're done. <laughs> That's this problem solved. Um, they could also say, actually, we're going to cut the lower mainland more than everybody else because this is, as the feds say, it's a housing issue. So maybe we want to divert some of the numbers away. That's possible. You know, this actually does give the, the provinces some scope to solve problems other than the one the feds are trying to solve, um, or at least in different ways, right? So laboratory federalism. Ontario is where it's just, you have no idea. Like the, the order of operations to solve this problem quickly are, is so long. Um, do you continue to allow the PPPs to have visa or the, the colleges to have visa spl slots that cover those PPPs if we know that demand is going to be driven down to almost zero uh, by, the, by September? So, you know, overall, uh, you, know, you know, this uh, was a pretty quick announcement, but with, you know, you mentioned the Conestoga uh, Reddit and, and so on. At, at some level, shouldn't the institutions or the provinces have seen this coming? You know, just seeing the, the erosion of social license that these institutions were, were starting to have, you know, so yeah, I guess that's more of a, like, first of all, you know, did they see this coming? And, and secondly, you know, should have they seen it coming? Well, I think they've all seen it coming since what was it, the August cabinet retreat. Uh, I, I think the signals were pretty clear that they were going to do something. Uh, in August, September, IRCC also came up with a, a different track of plans to try and create a set of a trusted institutions or recognized institutions. I forget which language they used. Um, it was goofy. Like it was, it was a goofy way to try and distinguish between institutions and eventually they shelved it. Um, it might come back into effect in a couple of years, but that was, they did a pilot project in it in the fall. So everybody understood they were serious about reducing, in, reducing intake somehow. Uh, I don't think anybody expected this set of measures um, because in Canada, we do a terrible job of uh, preparing people for policy changes, right? It's like a bunch of people lock themselves in the room and come up with a policy and then they announce it. Um, other countries don't do that. It, it's a very, it, it's, it's a very Canadian thing and it's not to our credit. How would it, how would they do it in other places? Well, in Australia, you would put out a white paper. You would say, listen, we need to get rid of, we need to reduce student numbers. Guys, what do you think the principles should be? And the government would say, here's the principles we're thinking of. We're inviting comment and they leave it out for three months and they probably bring someone in from outside government to lead that, uh, consultation process. Um, you know, it'd be the Moffat committee. In, in Australia, <laughs> you know, they'd ask you to come in and run a consultation. You go and talk to some people behind the scenes and we just don't do it. Right. I mean, we just, we lock people in a room and we, and we, and then we announce it and everybody's taken is flat footed. So yes, I think at least till, till September, but I think your bigger question, Mike is holy cow. Why didn't somebody stop Conestoga two years ago when they started going down this path? And the answer is, um, Conestoga absolutely sh should have seen it. I think it was hard, like in a sense, because they should be hearing, and I'm sure they are hearing from local business about what this is doing and from local citizens, what this is doing. One of the insidious things about PPPs though, is that um, as opposed to what Conestoga did, which was all inside its own institution, PPPs you set up in a different city. There was no way for the people of whatever it was, Scarborough, Thornhill, whatever, to complain to um, Northern College for bringing 7,500 students to their doorstep, right? They're just, they're not in the same community. So that, that whole thing about being part of the community was missing from PPP. It's it, that, the concept itself, I think, uh, reduced community responsibility. All I can tell you is the money blinded them. I saw you tweet about the reaction from students, how some of them were trying to get in touch to understand where are they going to school? Like, what do you, can you tell us a bit about what you're hearing? Oh, they're all one. They're all one sentence questions. Like, is York University a PPP? 
is 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 this college at you know is is the Brampton campus of you know this northern college uh, a PPP and I will say no or I will say yes and um, I, I mean to me what it tells me is they don't understand very much about the institutions they've applied to. That's so interesting to think because they're like coming to another country, often all the way on the other side of the world, and to not have that information, it must be really tough for them, like to 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 have this kind of black hole of of information where they're like, we don't know where we're going exactly and what the relationship. Is. I can't imagine how tough it is for them. I think that tells you that they're not here for the education; they're here for the 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 route to permanent residency. Like Canadian citizenship has value, um, and and college has found a way to monetize that. And uh, now we're going to have to unlearn how to monetize it to a to a large extent, I think. Uh, so, but but that's what it tells you. So here, here's the question I have though. Um, you know, we look at enrollments; they're they're way way up, and uh, you know, uh, postgraduate work permits aren't up nearly as much, which suggests to me that not everybody who comes here is going to end up getting a work permit. So, do we have an idea of what proportion of international students who go to one of these PPPs, like how successful were they in getting work permits or you know how realistic was that path or were they being you know misled by recruiters about how easy this process would be mike we don't have enough good data on how many visa yeah. applicants show up in the country right like when we've had this well there's been this whole discussion the globe's been trying to you know goad people at 19 percent of visa holders never show up for school i'm like well but they're that doesn't mean they're working in canada we, they may have never show, we have no idea did they show up or not i'm mean, sure there's some people doing that but um it's hard to say so we don't even know how many students are in the country uh we don't know even if they had work visas would they have been for long enough to qualify. I mean, I think one of the problems is, I had this discussion with someone at IRCC, they knew they had to change PGWP anyway, because PGWP is a pathway to something called the Canadian Experience Class, right? So it's a special category of about 50,000, 55,000 a year. Uh, and it's a way of giving visas to people who have experience in Canada. And they created this, this is Harper government, uh, you know, because 15 years ago, the main student the main immigration problem we were talking about was why do immigrants have such low salaries once they get here? And everyone said, well, it's because they lack Canadian experience. And, they, and so people said, well, let's, let's give them some, let's give them, let's let them stay after, let's let them come here to get school and they can stay and work. And then they will be the perfect immigrant that worked when the number of people in that pipeline was sort of in the 50 to a hundred thousand range. <laughs> and that was about how many were coming in. Uh, in about 2017, 2018. And since then, the numbers have vastly widened. And so the number of people who were eligible to get work visas uh, jumped way over the number that the Canadian experience class could handle. And yeah, that's a problem because there's a lot of people who've been brought here under the pretense that this is an automatic process and it's not. Um, when you it talk is about problem. IRCC, you're talking about Immigration, That's Refugees, it. and Citizenship Canada? My apologies for my jargon later, <laughs> uh, tirade. Yes, IRCC is Immigration, uh, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada. And that's a problem because you would have a lot of very disappointed people. And I've certainly heard indirectly from some uh, Canadian diplomats uh, who are of the view that um, having a lot of disappointed Punjabis in the country with an animus towards Canada is actually a security threat. Um, and we know, of course, that the, you know, the, 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 the large, the warnings that India has been giving about um, you know, Pakistan or about um, Khalistani extremists in Canada, that that's serious. Right. I mean, so so I think the government has realized, wait, whoa, we should have, we have a problem here um, and, and we don't want to make it any worse. So I think even if housing had not been an issue, I think there would have been a big change in PG, PGWP anyway, simply because the promises that were being made couldn't be kept. So it seems like the only way to fix this is to kind of let tuition rise for domestic students or the government will just have to pay more to the colleges and probably some colleges will have to close. Right. Like what what's the most likely scenario in your mind? God, I hope no public college is closed. Let me put it this way. I don't think the Ontario government will let anybody close because they almost let Laurentian do that. And and uh, once is unlucky, but twice is careless. And I think that's sort of the way that they're looking at this problem right now. So I what's think the there solution? are. Well, I mean, look, there has to be more money one way or the other. 
Uh, and you're right. It has to be, it, there are only two sources. There are students and there's government. I, I mean, the third choice is you allow colleges to put out a crappier project product, right? You, you let quality, you, you know, you have larger classes and you don't invest in technology the same way. And, you know, all the problems that international students were, were supposed to be the answer to. Um, and I, I suspect we'll see a lot of that number three. Um, I think you see a lot more distance delivery in the north. I think those four colleges are in, in the north are really going to have to band together to, to to do some of their services. And so I think you'll see Contact North, which is the the agency that does distance education in Ontario. I think you'll see them play a much larger role in education delivery. There will be increases for domestic tuition. I mean, that was one of the recommendations of the Blue Ribbon Panel on post-secondary funding, which came out in November, and which the government has still not responded to. Um, so we'll see. Uh, and the problem is, is that, uh, you know, all this is happening at a time where institutions, they're finalizing their budgets. They're trying to figure out how many seats they've got for different people. And we're talking about anywhere between about 15 and 60% of the budget that's suddenly at risk and they have no idea what's coming in. And so it's not simply the fact that we've changed policy. It's the fact that we've created this policy void, right? Nothing happens now until the provinces figure out how to distribute these <laughs> these visas. Um, and that uncertainty, I think, is going to last uh, well into March, would be my guess. March 31st is where the is where the feds assume the provinces will, will end up. That's how long it'll take them. I don't know if it'll, Ontario will be able to move that fast. I, I just, I, it's total chaos right now. Uh, do, do you have a sense of who's, you know, there's going to be winners and losers in the process. I mean, there has to be, it's kind of set up to be zero sum. Um, so, you know, where do we think the cuts are going to be? Is it, you know, going to be equally distributed between colleges and universities? Are they going to come down on one side than, than others? Like, how, how do you see this playing out? Well, the institutions that are most dependent on the PPPs are the ones that are going to be hammered. And that's the, that's the Northern institutions. It's Lambton, it's Niagara. Um, those, those are the ones that are in most serious trouble because their numbers are going to get zeroed out effectively. Um, now their costs go down too. Right. So that, that's okay. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So yeah. Northern Sioux, Canador, Lambton. If you were in charge of this, like what would be your favorite solution for this? I'd give them a one or two year bailout. I would say, right. I think, cause I think you can't make any decisions until the, until those institutions, the really depend, the ones that are dependent on PPP specifically know what to do because th then the PPP, they might, buy out some of those public colleges might try and buy out the private colleges and deliver it themselves it's not clear the provincial government will allow that but it is possible um they may fold them uh you know the i i think some of those privates will try and become degree granting institutions themselves um that's not a quick process that's not going to happen between now and september but it could happen between now and september 2025. who would be uh, doing the bailouts is that the province is that yeah, the, the province. Feds? absolutely it's the province Okay. I mean, that's the whole point of giving these caps back to the provinces. It's a way for the feds to say, guys, you always claim you have this big constitutional responsibility for post-secondary education and we should butt out. Guess what? Now you get to do your jobs, right? So that's, that's really what's going on. Um, so that's the first order problem. Then the second order problem is once you, once you deal with the fallout from the PPPs, how do you, how do you divide the remaining spots? Uh, because there's still going to be too many, you know, there's the, we're still going to be over the cap and that's where it gets nasty. Right. I mean, uh, I, the statements I've seen from the university side and the college side are very antagonistic, right? The university's position is this is a problem. The college is solved. If you solve this on our backs by reducing our numbers, we will hit the roof. And the colleges, uh, have put out a statement, which. I think is a little bit tone deaf. I don't think there's any acknowledgement of what the issue is. Um, but even within those sectors, uh, you know, cause I think the easiest thing for the province to do is just say, well, we're just going to cut everybody by 40%. And people are going to go, wait a minute. So Conestoga still gets 28,000. Like what, what is, what is there 20,000? Like, what does that mean? How could you possibly think that's a good idea? To me, the biggest PR coup so far here is that Conestoga has not been thrown onto the bus by the rest of the sector. Um, just cause it has so, it has so many and it, it's going to have to lose a, a, a disproportionate amount, but it's that kind of thing, right? So Algoma, same kind of thing. Algoma has got 900 students in Sault Ste. Marie. It's got 
9,000 students in Brampton, Mississauga, um, not under a PPP. They built their own campus and, and have their own space. But those institutions probably have to take an outside an outsize hit. Uh, but how do you do it in a fair manner, right? How are you going to figure that out? I keep Government hearing about Brampton. It's, it's often uh, mentioned. Why is that? Uh, because the students who are coming in are largely from India and they're assumed that they can homestay in Indian uh, homes. Okay, so that Br Brampton has been the spot where most people have put, and for that reason, right? Because it's sort of, a, you know, you get chain immigration, right? People go to places where they see a lot of people who are like them. And so Brampton has, a, given that the sub-degree market in particular has been from India, um, that's why it's there. Mike, if you have, were in charge of the solution, what do you think should happen? I, I think it's going to be challenging. I think, I, you know, I, I think they might have to roll the uh, clock back a few years and say, okay, well, since our cap is, you know, going back to 2020 or 2021 levels, you know, let's just roll the cap back to there. But that's going to create a lot of financial pressures for these institutions that have uh, increased, uh, increased quite massively. But so... I really don't have a great sense of how how this is how this is going to play out. You know, I, I agree that the PPPs are, are probably in trouble. I agree that the province is going to have to put more money on the table. But um, yeah, I think this is I think this is going to be going to be a big big challenge. And uh, you know, it, it, it's essentially zero sum. Um, you know, maybe they could take a, 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 a page out of Kathleen Wynne's uh, book and do some kind of cap and trade for 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 permits or, or something like that uh what does some that kind mean of, some, well i mean so so the the wind government had cap and trade for uh for for climate uh for for greenhouse gas emissions maybe maybe we just cap all the uh, uh cap all the colleges and universities at a certain level and if they want more permits they can buy and sell them from from each other i don't know it's it's a ridiculous I, idea more seriously i've heard that as an interprovincial thing right like why you know why give uh Quebec, a hundred thousand spaces when they're only going to fill seventy five thousand. Can't we bid for the other twenty five thousand? I've heard that before. There, there we go. Now I, I think that doesn't really solve Brampton's housing pro uh, yeah. problem. Yeah, no, if, exactly. Uh, but yeah, but but so, it keeps the national cap, right? So yeah. Thanks so much for joining us and explaining this. It's like it's been it's such a murky area, and I think that we have a better understanding now, thanks to you. So I appreciate your time. My pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Alex. That was, that was an awesome chat. I, I feel like I learned a lot. Thank you so much for watching The Missing Middle. Thanks, as always, to our producer, Meredith Martin. Please like, subscribe, or leave a comment. I'd love to hear from you. And we'll see you next time.